Everybody, this is going to be 5.7, Jacksonian democracy, and we're going to start with a quote from Mr. Jackson himself, who said, There are no necessary evils in government. Its evils exist only in its abuses. If it would confine itself to equal protection, and as heaven does its reigns, shower its favors alike on the high and the low, the rich and the poor, it would be an unqualified blessing. So this is Andrew Jackson basically saying he has problems with big government and the way it's run and who it helps, and more than that, who it does not help, too. So our objectives, we are going to analyze the movement towards greater democracy under Jackson, summarize the causes and effects of the removal of American Indians in the early 1800s, a.k.a. the Trail of Tears. We're going to evaluate the significance of the debate over tariffs and the idea of nullification. We're going to summarize the key events of the conflict over the Second Bank of the United States, and we're going to uh, analyze the political environment in the United States after Jackson. So quite a bit to get through, so let's get started. First, we're going to start with Andrew Jackson arriving on the scene, although we've met him before back in the War of 1812. So Andrew Jackson is a great example of sort of the idea of uh, a, a poor kid who made good. He was born into poverty. Uh, he became an orphan very young. He fought in the Revolutionary War as a teenager. Um, he became a successful lawyer, a successful politician. Uh, he was uh, the hero of the Battle of New Orleans during the War of 1812. It seems only natural that he becomes uh, a presidential candidate, although it was a little bit unique back then uh, because he was from a poor background. He was not the um, sort of... Uh, Washingtonian, Jeffersonian uh, model of a president uh, when he ran in 1824. So here's Andrew Jackson, who said at one point, do you think, do they think that I am such a fool as to think myself fit for president of the United States? No, sir. I know what I am fit for. I can command a body of men in a rough way, but I am not fit to be president, said Andrew Jackson, comma, soon to be president. So the election of uh, 1824, James Monroe said he would not run for a third term, thereby keeping up the uh, Washingtonian precedent of two terms and then you're done. Uh, this election would actually see a lot of candidates uh, try to become president, uh, four in total. Um, and this would also change political parties, and it would also change how we elect presidents in a way, too. So there were four people who wanted to replace James Monroe. First of all, John Quincy Adams, uh, Secretary of State and writer of the Monroe Doctrine, uh, with a lot of experience under his belt. William Crawford of Georgia, former Secretary of War in the Treasury, who unfortunately suffered a stroke and was out of it pretty early. Henry Clay of Kentucky, who is the Speaker of the House, the guy behind the Missouri Compromise, and one of, the, again, the most experienced lawmakers in this whole bunch. And also Andrew Jackson, the hero of the War of 1812, uh, and a senator and congressman from the West. So here are the four of them and how they did in the election of 1824, which we're going to talk about a little bit more here. So on Election Day, Andrew Jackson got the most popular votes and the most electoral votes. However, since it was split four ways, nobody had the majority needed in order to become president. And so the House of Representatives had to decide who's going to become president. Um, this is uh, in, the, in the Constitution, the House of Representatives gets to make this choice. Now, obviously, the, the front runner should be Andrew Jackson because he got both, both the popular and electoral majority of any uh, person running for president, but he didn't get enough. And also, Henry Clay had serious issues with Jackson. He did not like Jackson personally. He also thought that John Quincy Adams was the better, uh, more professional, more reliable choice. And so Henry Clay uh, supported John Adams John Quincy Adams for the presidency, and John Quincy Adams won. So here's our sixth president, John Quincy Adams, uh, 1825 to 29, another one-termer, just like his dad, from Massachusetts. Uh, John Quincy Adams had a long list of uh, jobs before he became president. He was probably our best foreign minister. He was minister to the Netherlands, to Prussia, to Russia, to Great Britain. He became a senator from Massachusetts, and of course was Monroe's Secretary of State, where he helped to write the Monroe Doctrine. 
He is also the first son of a president to become president, although not the only one. He is also the only president who became a congressman after being president. And in fact, he was a congressman when he died. He was giving a speech on the floor uh, talking about uh, the evils of slavery, and he had a stroke on the floor of the Congress. Um, allegedly, you can still hear uh, the ghost of John Quincy Adams whispering, trying to finish his uh, speech. Now, Adams, very quickly after he became president, named Henry Clay as his Secretary of State. Um, this, so, a lot of people saw this as sort of bad politics right here. He put a guy who helped make him president in a presidential sort of support position. Uh, fans of Jackson said that these two had used a corrupt bargain to make Adams the president and had therefore cheated Andrew Jackson out of the presidency. John Quincy Adams had a tough four years as president, partially because he wanted to get a lot of big uh, nationalistic internal improvements passed, and the country wasn't really going for that at that time. Um, and also, he had this sort of corrupt bargain hanging over his head, whether it was true or not. Meanwhile, Andrew Jackson and his supporters were looking at the election of 1828, uh, Jackson and his close friend Martin Van Buren worked together to weaken Adams and also to paint Andrew Jackson as sort of this man of the people, this ideal candidate. Uh, this election was also going to be more democratic with a small d, meaning more people would have the right to vote in this election of 1828. So during the 1820s, we see that a lot of states made it easier for white men to vote. They got rid of the idea that it was just white male landowners who got the vote. This went against sort of the old method of, you know, the, the wealthy elites being the ones who voted because they were the ones more trustworthy with the power of voting. Uh, instead, more common everyday people got to vote. Um, and this new increase in regular average day voters was good for Jackson because Jackson painted himself, again, he sold himself as a man of the people. Adams didn't have that man of the people touch. So Jackson supporters started calling themselves Democrats, and Andrew Jackson helped to create the Democratic Party in eight, uh, during this time period. In 1828, Andrew Jackson was elected president. He won by a huge margin. Uh, he got both the Electoral College and the popular vote by a lot this time. Um, and Jackson promised to return to sort of small state government after the big federal government of John Quincy Adams. So here's our seventh president, Andrew Jackson. Uh, he is uh, president from 1829 to 37 from the Carolinas, uh, but lived a lot of his life in Tennessee. He was a, uh, in the Army, he was a general, congressman from Tennessee, the military governor of Florida, and senator from Tennessee. So he did have experience, too. It wasn't like he was living out in the woods until it was time to become president. Uh, he's also the first president to have an assassination attempt. Uh, a guy from Great Britain who was um, a little bit mentally unbalanced, believed that he was King Richard III, and the only thing that was keeping him from becoming King of England was Andrew Jackson. So he went after Jackson, shot at him twice, both shots misfired, and Andrew Jackson nearly beat the poor guy to death with his cane after he was done shooting at him. So, the Democrats created a new kind of political machine. They were uh, into getting more and more people involved in the political process. And the best way to do this was to get them excited about it, make it not just about like, here's my where I stand on certain issues. Instead, it was more like, here's the party that we're going to have, the literal party, along with the political party. They used big public, public rallies and parties and barbecues and drinks and songs and, you know, fun times to get people on their side. Jackson also promised that if you support me, uh, I will help you find a good job within the U.S. government once I become president. And this is known as the spoils system. Uh, when he became president, Jackson fired a lot of the Washingtonians and replaced them with people uh, from his party who helped him get elected. This is the idea of to the victor go the spoils. This is why we call it the spoils system. So this is a uh, political cartoon from 1877 of Andrew Jackson sitting on top of a pig that is eating from the spoils system uh, baskets down there. Now, Andrew Jackson did a lot of controversial things as President of the United States. We're going to talk about one here, Indian removal. 
So Jackson had become president partially thanks to the votes of Southerners. Uh, in return, the Southerners wanted his support in removing Native Americans from their land. Many of these natives, including the Cherokee, had uh, become what they were called civilized tribes. They had taken on customs of white people, including uh, speaking English, um, adopting the sort of yeoman farmer status of Jeffersonians, um, and they sort of believed that you know the 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 American government had no right to take their land, um, and they were living in the Georgia area mostly. So here are the five civilized tribes, the Cherokee, Choctaw, Muscogee, Chickasaw, and Seminole tribes. Jackson, however, said that the Native American tribes had to go, that uh, they had no right to their land because of their quote-unquote savage ways. And so between 1827 and 1830s, the southern states dissolved the power, the autonomy, the independence of these tribes, and um, started to talk about forcing them out. In 1832, the Cherokee actually went to the Supreme Court saying they don't have the right to kick us out. Um, they can't, we can't be forced off of our own land. Uh, and amazingly enough, John Marshall, who is still the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, agreed with the Cherokee. Uh, John Marshall said that the Cherokee could not be forced off their lands. And this, uh, what, what happened though was very important, is that Andrew Jackson straight up ignored the Supreme Court and said, I'm going to take the Cherokee off their land. Um, he basically said that, you know, John Marshall can make all the decisions he wants. However, I'm the one with the army, I'm the one with the power, and I'm going to remove the Native Americans based on the Indian Removal Act of 1830. And this really shows the power of Andrew Jackson. Uh, they called him the first imperial president, the first president with the power of a king. He's ignoring checks and balances, he's ignoring precedent, and he's doing what he feels is necessary. According to uh, some, Andrew Jackson said, Mr. Marshall has made his ruling, now let him enforce it. And this led to the Trail of Tears in 1838. Now, by this time, Andrew Jackson is out of office, but uh, in 1838, the Cherokee are forced off their land, uh, at least 16,000 Cherokee, possibly more, uh, and they are marched to Oklahoma in what is called the Trail of Tears. Uh, at least 4,000 Native Americans died along the way, and they also lost a lot of their property, their goods, their belongings, and their traditional beliefs along the way, too. So here is a painting of the Trail of Tears, and Andrew Jackson also allegedly once said, build a fire under them. When it gets hot enough, they'll move. And so here are the, um, the, the tribes being moved off their land into... Uh, Indian Territory, what is modern-day Oklahoma. Now, a few tribes actually fought back, like the Seminole in Florida. Uh, however, they lost and they were eventually uh, expelled. Chief Blackhawk in Illinois, which is why the Illinois hockey team is called the Chicago Blackhawks, led the tribe of the Sauk and Fox uh, against, the, um, uh, against the Americans. This is known as the Blackhawk War. Uh, Abraham Lincoln actually fought in that war. Um, and all the Native American rebellions in the uh, east of the Mississippi River were eventually put down, and they were forced onto reservations in what was called Indian Territory at the time. Now, let's look at nullification, another big debate that Jackson's having. In 1828, Congress passed a large tax on imported goods, um, and this tariff, this is what we call a tax on imported goods, would largely impact the South. Um, the South had to buy imported goods uh, with the tariff. The North did not. Um, the South, therefore, did not like this tariff. They called it the tariff of abominations. Uh, an abomination is something that's evil and disgraceful. One of the reasons the South did not like this tariff was because the national government was telling the state governments what their job was, what their business was. The national government was saying, you're going to pay this tax whether you like it or not. The Southern states, especially South Carolina, went against this tariff. John C. Calhoun of South Carolina was at the forefront, which is interesting because John C. Calhoun is also Andrew Jackson's vice president at the time. And he is a champion of the idea of nullification, the idea that um, the states could cancel national laws if they did not like them or if they thought they were unconstitutional. 
So Calhoun expected Jackson to veto this tariff because Jackson is usually in favor of states' rights. However, Jackson signed it into law. So this is John C. Calhoun, who's just something about him looks really scary. Uh, 1782 to 1850, he's from South Carolina. He's a congressman, a senator, the Secretary of War, Secretary of State, and Vice President under both John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson. Uh, John C. Calhoun said, We make a great mistake in supposing all people are capable of self-government. Now, uh, in 1832, South Carolina canceled the tariff. They nullified it. They said the states do not have to follow a national law that they disagree with. This state of South Carolina also said that if the government tried to force them to uh, keep this tariff, then South Carolina would leave the United States. Uh, Jackson said that a state could not leave. They could not secede from the Union. Uh, and he said, if you guys try to leave, I'm going to send troops into South Carolina to stop you from doing it. This is what's called the Force Act. Um, now, uh, it looked like we might have a civil war on our hands in 1832. Um, to avoid it, Henry Clay made another compromise. He lowered the tariff, uh, and eventually both sides sort of backed down a little bit. However, we nearly had a civil war over states' rights versus national rights in the 1830s. Uh, we were this close to it, which means that, uh, you know, we, we have another one in 30 years, but we got very close at that point. Now, let's also look at the Bank War, another one of the controversial things that Jackson did. Controversial president he was. So, other than nullification, uh, Jackson was in general in favor of states' rights and in favor of the South. He believed that farmers were the real Americans. Uh, he distrusted and disliked bankers. Uh, he thought bankers were corrupt and greedy and just taking money away from the poor. Um, this was also a time where we see the, the divide between the rich and the poor widening. So, Jackson especially did not like the Bank of the United States, the second Bank of the United States. Um, he thought it was exceptionally corrupt, exceptionally greedy. Uh, he blamed the bank for the financial panic of 1819. Now, while rich merchants saw the bank as a promoter of economic growth, Democrats saw it as greedy and corrupt and also unconstitutional as well. So, uh, eventually, friends of the bank uh, voted to try to get the bank renewed for another 20 years. In fact, they did it a little bit early, trying to get Jackson into trouble. However, Jackson vetoed the renewal of the Bank of the United States, saying that he was uh, protecting uh, the regular, everyday Americans from the greedy, rich, corrupt, few Amer elite Americans up at the top. Enemies of Andrew Jackson saw this killing of the Bank of the United States as the final straw. They were calling Andrew Jackson a tyrant, and they said he was going beyond his power of the presidency, uh, becoming almost imperial, almost like a king. In response, the enemies of Andrew Jackson formed a new political party called the Whigs. They were named after a uh, political party in uh, England. So here is a Whig political cartoon showing Andrew Jackson as King Andrew I, uh, wielding the power of the veto, standing on top of the Constitution of the United States, and on top of uh, a bill for internal improvements and a bill for the National Bank. This new party was led by Henry Clay and John C. Calhoun, um, two guys who had very little in common, did not agree with each other. The only thing that they agreed on was the fact that they did not like Andrew Jackson. Whigs, in general, were fav in favor of a big federal government, uh, they were in favor of the internal improvements in general, uh, but mainly they were not in favor of Andrew Jackson, and that's really what brought these guys together. In 1832, the Whigs ran Henry Clay for president, uh, and he was beaten by Andrew Jackson. Uh, Andrew Jackson trounced him. So Jackson moved very quickly after this to remove all federal funds out of the Bank of the United States and move them into what he called his pet banks, local state banks that he was sort of, he and his friends had uh, interests in. Now, even though the Bank of the United States was technically still alive, uh, taking out the federal funds ended it. And in 1835, John Marshall died, so we see that the, uh, the last of the Federalists are kind of gone at this point. And Jackson replaced John Marshall with the guy who had killed the Bank of the United States, his Secretary of the Treasury, Roger Taney. 
Roger Taney is going to be back when we get to Dred Scott right before the Civil War. Uh, he is the chief justice at a point when um, he made what some people think is the worst uh, decision the Supreme Court ever made. Now, let's look at what happened after Jackson. Partially, what happened was Jackson won with the Bank of the United States, but it really weakened the U.S. economy. So the people who followed Jackson sort of had to deal with the economic fallout of killing the Bank of the United States. State banks who had this new power kind of had a field day with it. They uh, printed off millions of, of uh, paper dollars that were not backed by gold or silver. Uh, they ran into massive inflation. And this hurt mainly the poor farmers, the very people Jackson said he was trying to protect. Uh, when Jackson retired in 1836, uh, he basically pointed at his next in line, Martin Van Buren, and said, this is your guy. Uh, and Martin Van Buren won the election of 1836, but in 1837, we had a massive panic, a financial disaster, an economic collapse that hit, partially due to the killing of the National Bank. A lot of businesses went bankrupt, a lot of farmers lost their land, and a lot of urban city workers lost their job, which... Not a lot of the anger was pointed at Jackson. Instead, a lot of the anger was pointed at um, Van Buren for this. So here's our eighth president, Martin Van Buren, 1837 to 41. Uh, who, who could have guessed that uh, a, a president who was president during a massive uh, uh, economic collapse would only be a one-termer? Uh, he is from Kinderhook, New York, where he was a senator, a governor of New York, secretary of state, Minister to Great Britain and Vice President after John C. Calhoun left uh, in the Jackson Party. He also um, is the only president that we know of who spoke English as a second language. He actually spoke Dutch before he spoke English. So the economic depression was really good for the Whig Party, and so they ran basically Andrew Jackson 2.0, a guy named William Henry Harrison, who was another hero of the War of 1812, the hero of the Battle of Tippecanoe. And they used a lot of these sort of uh, Jacksonian uh, concepts for, for creating a, a president. They had a lot of parties. They um, made him a war hero. They tried to make him seem like an everyday normal guy. Um, the, the Harrison campaign didn't really have a lot of ideas, but it did throw a lot of parties instead. And the Whigs ran him as a simple farmer, which he was not, uh, who lived in a log cabin, which he didn't, uh, who loved some old-fashioned uh, hard cider, uh, just like an everyday normal guy. Actually, he preferred whiskey, so that's three strikes. Um, basically, they were trying to make Harrison another Andrew Jackson, uh, and they were trying to make him sort of a simple guy in comparison to the rich sort of vain, pompous Martin Van Buren. They even gave William Henry Harrison his own theme song called Tippecanoe and Tyler II. Uh, and they painted him, like I said, as sort of a regular, everyday guy, even though he's from one of the wealthiest families in Virginia. And this worked. The Whigs won. William Henry Harrison became president of the United States, and the Whigs also took control of Congress at this time. However, their victory was rather short-lived. Uh, sadly, uh, forgive the joke, so was Harrison. Harrison died after a month in office, and his vice president, John Tyler, became president. Uh, Tyler was an interesting character. He was a Democrat who joined the Whig Party uh, because he disagreed with Andrew Jackson. However, he didn't really adhere to any Whig values. He was a Democrat at heart. Uh, and so what we see is that um, he didn't have a lot of power. He had a rough four years as president. The one thing that he did do, however, was that he basically made it a point that a vice president who becomes president uh, is not just a placeholder. They have all the powers of the president. They are a full president of the United States. And since this was the first time this had ever happened, um, this sort of answered that question. So here is William Henry Harrison, president for a month from 1841 to 1841 from Virginia, uh, but he lived in the West a good chunk of his life, just like Jackson. Uh, he was a general during the War of 1812, congressman of the Northwest Territory, governor of Indiana Territory, congressman and senator from Ohio, and also our first president to die in office. And here is John Tyler, 1841 to 45, from Charles City in Virginia, 
He was a congressman from Virginia, governor of Virginia, senator from Virginia, and vice president of the United States. Uh, after his time in office, though, uh, he had a bit of a bad track record. Uh, he actually became a congressman for the Confederate States of America during the Civil War before passing away. Uh, so he has a bit of a, um, a blotch on his record.